Garbage bins, they're everywhere. If you look inside, you'll find garbage. Since garbage bins are almost uniquely human, or at least related to human at some point in their lifetime, they contain little pieces of information, traces of life of their user. These collections of garbage can piece together a story. You can go to the accumulated sites of garbage and you can see other people's computers, couches, and refrigerators. Maybe they were once used by a happy family. The couch was once filled with people gathering together to watch a movie. The computer was used to explore the fascinating details of the human anatomy by teenage boys. And the refrigerator was once filled with calendars, appointments, and other things people put up on their refrigerator. If you look in a room, you'll find your old clothes, things you wore when you were a child. It tells what kind of person you were, whether you were expressive or whether your parents do all the buying for you that it resembles what they want from you. But all are the same. It tells you a story, a projection of a person's mind, an embodiment of ideas that were realized into physical material. All those things can tell a lot about the people that use them. Just look at the fridge at your house. It's full of pictures of your past, the plans you're going to make, a trip to the dentist, or whatever. Look at how much stuff you buy at your house. Not only that, your internet searches, your taxes, the books you read, the scar on your forehead, the scratches on your car, the shape of the mountains, everything that we can see, they all can tell a story if you look really closely. We can conclude what the weather looked like by looking at tree rings. We can tell about a dinosaur by their footprints and fossils. And isn't it crazy how we can keep history as by using symbols and signs inscribed on rocks and papers. Even specks of dust have a lot of things to tell since they are made of skin cells, animal dander, clothes that you wear, or even minerals from outer space. We can imagine what Greenland looked like 2 million years ago when we found genetic material from that time. We can even know what we once were by looking at the material in our genes and how the immune system works by looking at the suppressed reservoirs in our DNA. All the stuff that we've seen was just information. Information is abstract and it has the power to inform. Any natural process that isn't random and any observable pattern can be seen to convey information. Information itself is a knowledge, but the meaning that may be derived from a representation through interpretation can be. Information is any pattern that can influence the transformation or formation of other patterns and a conscious mind is not needed to perceive the pattern. For example, DNA is a pattern that influences the formation and development of organisms without any need for a conscious mind. Gregory Bateson defines information as a difference that makes a difference. Information is often processed in a process that uses repetition to generate a sequence. For example, in written text, each symbol or letter conveys information to the word it is part of. Each word then conveys information relevant to the phrase it is part of. Each phrase conveys information relevant to the sentence it is part of, and so on until the final step, it is interpreted and becomes knowledge. You can also get knowledge from information in a collection of data derived by analysis. For example, when we collect every customer's order in a restaurant and analyze them, we can know what the most popular dish is and the least favorite one. And this can be seen as analyzing information to derive knowledge. There are people who derive knowledge for a living, and there are lots of them. Some of them are analysts, economists, scientists, and journalists. And in a sense, they're trying to create a story from the traces left behind. Some of these stories can be messy. It might include murder, or whatever heinous crimes that humans can do. These people are detectives or investigators, and they must refer to and painstakingly piece together the often limited information that is available to them to find out what happened. Information can shape our behavior and mindset, especially cultural artifacts like the media that communicates information. Pheromones are also said to be information in this sense. However, you need the same social situation for something to be communicated properly, usually in the same language that is mutually understood. The plato del día tenemos lentejas con arroz. Mm, qué rico. Information can be found from pattern deviations and getting information depends on being able to recognize them and exploit these patterns. For one to access the information that there is fire from the sign that there is smoke, one must know the correlation between smoke and fire. Information can give meanings, and meanings can be intentional like words being spoken, Uno, sí. or unintentional like symptoms being assigned for a particular medical condition. 
This process of carrying meaning depends on the use of codes, like the sounds made to form words, body movements to show attitudes or emotions, or even the clothes they wear. To create a word to refer to a thing, the community must agree on a simple meaning within their language, and the word can transmit the meaning only within that language's grammatical structure and codes. Codes also represent the value of a culture, and they are able to add connotations to daily life. These little pieces of information, however small they are, can radically change a person. For example, spoken words are just sounds, and sounds are just airwaves that are disturbed, but it contains a lot of information, and that little perturbation can change our state of mind. The brain is a delicate thing, and the state of our mind represents ourselves. A little change in the brain structure can change your behavior. When you learn something new, you change your behavior. For example, when you learn about the new diet or how eating less cholesterol can help you. It also makes you mad, happy, sad, and disgusted. You can also infer information from people's facial expressions, gestures, and the way they dress. All these changes can be made simply from the information that can be found in sounds. So what would happen if sounds, however, don't linger around, at least not during ancient times. So they needed a medium to record things. Recorded history begins around 4 BC, coinciding with the invention of writing. It is relatively recent, and it is limited since humans don't always record everything like natural disasters or names of individuals. So we get different contexts of information in different periods of time. Over time though, we found ways to record history with the advancements of technology like photography, audio recordings, and video recordings. Now, we move to things that are less significant, like internet archives that document the history of the internet, and some other history like oral history to preserve things that aren't usually recorded like family history or everyday life. We humans, in a sense, are also a form of record. We gather information, and every person has a story to tell. We're equipped with biological technology, and information is stored in the brain. And I guess we're far more advanced than any of our... Um, non-biological technology. The brain structure itself contains images, sounds, and smells of the past or even the scenario of the probable future. It's no surprise though that the brain is the most complex structure known to humankind. Codes can be so important to businesses since they may make or break a brand, especially in the age of globalization. You may find it easy to make a joke to your friends within the same culture since you have similar codes. But intentional humor may feel cross-culturally, because jokes are not on code for the receiving culture. An example of this can be seen between Tokyo Disneyland with Disneyland Paris, where Tokyo sells the most souvenirs of any Disney theme park since the Japanese love cute things and they value gift-giving in their culture code, while Paris failed because their telling of European folklore is seen as elitist and insulting. Paris failed because it violated the code of European culture. Another example is a US salesperson doing business in Japan might interpret silence following an offer as rejection, while to Japanese negotiators, silence means the offer is being considered. This difference in interpretation represents a difference in semiotics. So if you want to send the right message and the right meaning to people, you have to take into account a lot of things, where they live, the kind of music they listen to, and the kind of genres your message will be in. The message may sound the same to all people, but they all can have significant differences in interpretations. Essentially, it all comes down to the way we interpret them. Human stuff doesn't mean anything to animals, just like pheromones of animals. To us, it's nothing but a chemical that attracts them to behave or whatever. So while information can be objective in a way, humans are not objective. People can interpret information in ways that suit their beliefs. Let's take language for example. A word can have an entirely different connotation to people of different age groups even when they have the same culture. Some languages use tone to differentiate meaning, and different intonation gives different meanings in Mandarin for example. And across cultures, the same word may mean an entirely different thing, and it may not be accessible to you since you are limited to only a few languages. So yeah, you need the right circumstances to get the right meaning. Luciano Floridi listed out four mutually compatible phenomena that can be seen as information. Information about something, information as something, information for something, and information in something. In James Glake's book, he talked about African talking trumps that were used to send messages back and forth between villages over a long distance by relay. Then he talked about 
the implication of long-distance telegraph and phone communication that pervades the industrial age west. Then we learn about the digital nature of information using the unit as bit or qubit. He then talk about the overwhelming amount of information created daily. He compared Wikipedia, which is the very thing I'm using to make this video, to the Library of Babel, since Wikipedia has user-generated content and struggles with the ongoing battle with inclusionist, deletionist, and vandals. The flood of information that we have right now is a challenge since it takes a lot more effort to delete or remove unwanted information than to create it. Talking about the library, the Library of Babel by George Louis Borges is a short story about a universe in the form of a vast library containing all possible 410 page books. The order and content of the books are random and meaningless, but since it contains every possible ordering of just 25 basic characters, they must contain every coherent book ever written, or that might ever be written. It must contain every recorded history, biographies of any person, translation of every book in all languages, and even predictions of the future. The concept of the library is often compared to the monkey theorem that says a monkey with a typewriter in a few eternities would produce all books in the British Museum. Some compare the library to biology, at the full possible set of origin sequences. Finding a book that makes sense would be almost impossible in the library. The same would be true for protein sequences if it wasn't for natural selection. The infinite monkey theorem says that a monkey with a typewriter would eventually type out any text like William Shakespeare's Hamlet given infinite time. The probability of it happening though is so low that it would take longer than the age of the universe, but technically not zero. However, in 2002, lecturers and students from the University of Plymouth tried putting real monkeys with a computer keyboard. The monkeys didn't produce anything longer than 5 pages, mostly with the letter S, and the lead male began hitting it with stones and other monkeys followed by soiling it. They then said that they learned an awful lot from it, concluding that monkeys are not random generators. George Burgess traced the infinite monkey concept to Aristotle's metaphysics. He explained the views of Lysippus, who believed that the world arose through the random combination of atoms. Aristotle, who was against the atomistic view, said that atoms are homogeneous, and their possible arrangements only differ in shape, position, and ordering. He then compared a tragedy and a comedy consisting of the same atoms. Borges then imagined this to its fullest extreme. He said that the library would contain everything we can imagine, but it would take generations of mankind before the library could ever reward them with a tolerable page. I mean, the reading that this takes feels like going through the library of Babel, since it just takes so much time to find relevant information. Anyway, like usual, some apologists like John MacArthur claim that genetic mutations that are necessary to produce a tapeworm from an amoeba are as unlikely as a monkey's tapping handless soliloquy, implying that the odds against evolution are impossible to overcome. But Richard Dawkins showed that evolution has no long-term plan, nor does it move toward progress such as humans. In terms of the monkey typing, it means that Romeo and Juliet can be produced relatively quickly if it's placed under the constraints of a non-random Darwinian type selection improving each successive generation of typing monkeys. This thought experiment prompted people to think about random generators. Instead of making them random, restrictions can be used to follow meaningful vocabulary and random document generated can even fool some humans. OpenAI, for example, produced generative pre-trained Transformer 2 or GPT-2 that can produce news articles given a two-sentence input from humans. The AI was so effective it was killed down and the group released statement regarding concerns about large language models being used to generate deceptive, biased, or abusive language at scale. However, things are easily lost or jumbled by other things. Photons are carried away and you can catch them because apparently, the universe prevents you from reaching their speed. Sounds while lingering longer than light. be lost too. Smells last a lot longer, so you can make some kind of information from it. You can trace criminals using dogs, or you can reminisce about the moments with your lover by smelling the jacket that they gave you. It's ironic though that while light and sound don't linger long, they can be recorded and captured using pictures and audio recording. Smell on the other hand, while lasting a bit longer, will fade, and it is very hard to preserve them. I guess that's how the universe balances out things. Or, or not. Things are also are not as simple as they seem. For example, 
Carbon dating isn't super precise. We still misdiagnose a lot of our diseases, and there are a lot of things that aren't solved. For example, we don't know for certain what happened during the Cambrian explosion. There are crimes we can solve. We don't know about the lives of the people of the past and the secrets that were told in private. And there's this problem with information in black holes called the black hole information paradox. Even if things are recorded, it's not entirely guaranteed that they're reliable. The person recording it may record it according to their view. The person that reads the recorded history may choose to interpret it using his own views that can be entirely different from the person recording it and from the reality itself. Things that were documented can be corrupted. They can be destroyed. They can fade away. And one of the things that we often overlook as a recording device, our memory, is not very reliable too. Sometimes we can form false memories by imagining things a bit too strongly. And sometimes other people can influence our memory into remembering things that never happened. So even with all the technology that we have accumulated, we still can derive all knowledge from the information that we have. We even struggle to record smell, and it is seen as a technical challenge. But even if we could record everything, not everything is worth keeping. Just like the Library of Babel which is filled with a lot of nonsensical words, the recorded information, while already poses problems with the immeasurable amount that they have, will contain things that are not accurate and it would take a lot more effort to remove them than to create them. The same can be said for the garbage in the bin. It is full of things that are not wanted. Traces and histories of people are the kind of people that they used to be and don't want to be. Things that are not significant in their lives. Messy breakups, bad decisions, and just little things that are not significant because they're, well, garbage. But just like the Library of Babel, if you look hard enough in the collection of seemingly useless garbage, and you try hard enough to piece together the little information that you can find, they can tell a story that is long forgotten, remnants and traces of life that were once significant. Thank you.